All right, guys. Um, hopefully you can kind of see me. I know you can see my screen. Um, and I apologize for not being there in person, but obviously I'm, I'm trying to adhere to all of the health department's uh, recommendations right now. Uh, I have uh, some, some older, uh, my, both my family and my in-laws that are, uh, we see quite frequently with a newborn baby. So I uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure we didn't try to transmit anything that we didn't have to. So I appreciate the, uh, the, the time uh, and the understanding. Um, I'll do everything virtually. If you do have any questions, I can only see two of you in the screen right now. Um, I don't know how many are in the, in the audience, but. All right, well, we'll go with it. All right, fantastic. Well, I'll go through. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just kind of speak up and speak loudly and clearly, and I can hear you through the, uh, the, the microphone on the computer. And if uh, not, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, so a little bit about the, uh, the Tennessee wine industry uh, to start. Um, we'll go into a kind of a full background on where we are uh, as a, as a uh, commercial industry and what's kind of coming down the pipeline. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Adam Akampora. I'm the executive director for the Tennessee Farm Wine Growers Alliance. Uh, the TFWA was founded in 1982. Uh, we were actually an offshoot from the TVOS. Um, uh, your same founders, uh, Faye Wheeler, uh, William O'Beach, uh, ended up forming the TFWA in the 80s because as they took their operation commercial, they realized that there were a lot of uh, legislative changes that had to happen in Tennessee to make it feasible to have a, a business here. Um, so early industry timeline, a uh, little history for all of you guys is... Uh, 1874, the uh, then Commissioner of Agriculture for Tennessee, uh, Jay Kildebrew, actually uh, devoted an entire chapter about the uh, prospects and profitability of grapes in Tennessee. Uh, in 1880, we're actually showing uh, roughly around 1,200 acres of commercial vineyards, uh, producing about 65,000 gallons of wine. Uh, but 1907, we started to early adopt prohibition across Tennessee. Uh, except for the, uh, the major uh, metropolitan areas. And by 1919, uh, with the 18th Amendment, we went completely dry. Uh, and what that really meant for uh, us as an industry is that we didn't even have medicinal or religious uh, exemptions practicing here in Tennessee. So we lost pretty much from 1907 to 1973, you know, uh, 70 some odd years almost of uh, it, intrinsic knowledge of the industry of how to actually grow fruit, what to grow where, and then how to process it. Uh, so this really, really set us back. Uh, so in 1970, uh, well, in the mid seventies, uh, we had some uh, interest from uh, growers across the state. And in 73, the TVOS uh, started, obviously you guys are still around today. Um, but this was really kind of the, the kicking off and, and the resurgence of the industry in, in the state. Uh, and in 1980, uh, the first commercial crush happened at Highland Manor Winery with Faye Wheeler. Um, and in about two years after that, they quickly saw, like I said, that the, uh, the climate in Tennessee wasn't conducive for uh, growing a business uh, in the wine production. Um, so they uh, went about uh, trying to ratify some laws and created the TFWA for that uh, strict purpose. Uh, in 1985, uh, then Governor Alexander created the Tennessee Viticulture Advisory Board, uh, which was uh, initially just a, it was just an advisory board to advise the Department of Agriculture and the Commissioner of Agriculture, and hopefully the legislatures on the challenges that face the industry and the opportunities that face the industry. Um, but they had no teeth or ability to really do anything. Um, in 2017, uh, the TFWA, through the uh, support of the uh, Department of Ag, uh, secured a specialty crop block for me, uh, and I started in uh, April of 2018, actually, uh, and I'm the first uh, full-time staff member the industry has had, um, so it really kind of uh, uh, refocused the industry on getting serious about establishing the organizational structures uh, and the, the uh, backbone to continue to grow the industry. Uh, in 2019, uh, just this past year, we actually had the newly uh, created Wine and Grape Board passed by the legislature and signed by Governor Lee. Uh, this replaces the Viticulture Advisory Board. Um, a few big differences with uh, the Wine and Grape Board compared to the, the, v, the Viticulture Advisory Board. 
Um, number one, with the Viticulture Advisory Board, we sometimes had a challenge with um, talking about the end product of uh, the grape. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of comfort in talking about agriculture and viticulture, which was fantastic, but we didn't want to have conversations about what that end product became, uh, turning it into wine or alcohol, basically, uh, at the state level. Um, so that was a, a challenge that we had for many years. We also had the challenge that the video. So there was a question. <laughs> uh, we also had the challenge that the Viticulture Advisory Board had no real um, financing and had no ability to expend money. Um, so the Wine and Grape Board actually has the ability to promulgate rules. Uh, they also have the ability to keep and hold funds and expend those funds for the purposes of growing the industry. So that's really a big difference too. Um, so today, uh, winery research across the state of Tennessee, uh, we're impacting agriculture, manufacturing, and tourism. Um, I believe as of last week, we are actually at 70 wineries now. Um, what you're looking at is a map of the tasting rooms that are part of the TFWA association. Um, so it's, it's about, we're about 70% of the commercial industry is represented by us. Um, so there are a few uh, wineries and tasting rooms that are not shown on this map. Uh, we make a big economic impact. Uh, as of 2017, uh, we accounted for about $1.9 billion in total economic impact. Um, uh, a full, a uh, full job uh, view. So looking at uh, production, vineyard, wholesale, retail, full-time, part-time, seasonal, it's about 16,700 jobs. Um, we operate a vineyard or winery in 50 of the counties across the state, uh, contributing to about $104 of state and local taxes. That's excise sales, payroll, all that fun stuff, and about $140 million in federal taxes. Um, as of 2017, we're looking at about 86 commercial growers across the state with 4.8 million pounds of fruit um, being utilized. And this uh, next number, there's 488 plus acres. Um, there's some discrepancies. Uh, if you look at a, a USDA NAS report, you'll actually see about 900 uh, or so acres in the USDA NAS report. Uh, we're looking at what our what's commercial acreage versus uh, what might be um, uh, personal use acreage. Um, because when you look at that NAS report and dive down into the numbers, uh, the average size of a, a vineyard in Tennessee is about a half acre. Um, once you, once you strip away the, the larger producers, like, like a Sally notch, um, you know, we start looking at a lot of smaller uh, vineyard formats. So. Uh, so where is Tennessee right now? Um, so this is as of the end of uh, 2019. We had about 68 licensed wineries. Uh, we estimated production of about 662,000 gallons of wine across the state, uh, pulling in roughly around 4,415 tons of fruit. Um, and this is an internal survey that we send out to uh, both members and non-members of the association to try to get a, a snapshot of what the industry is doing. Um, out of that 662,000 gall gallons, only about 20% of it is Tennessee fruit. So we are sourcing a lot of our fruit, juice, and wine from other states right now. Um, this is largely due to a lack of, of uh, commercial vineyards in the state. Uh, we are about 1,000 acres shy of where we'd like to be to meet our current uh, wine demands. Um, and the, what's really interesting, too, is the number one a uh, statement for why wineries are not using Tennessee fruit is they cannot find a large, a large enough source for the, for the uh, type of wine they're producing in Tennessee. Um, not necessarily that they can't find the fruit in Tennessee, uh, like so they're not looking for Merlot per se, but they can't find what they're already working with that grows here in the state. And uh, we actually had a, a, a prime example, we just did a growers workshop with uh, some prospective uh, farmers uh, a few weeks ago. And one of my winery members said, hey, I just pulled in $100,000 of fruit out of New York. Things like Catawba, Chamberson, uh, Saval, things that we can grow here in the state and we are not. So we are, we are doing an active push to try to increase uh, the number of acreage over the next few years. Uh, 
Uh, so also in 2019, part of the Harvest and Crush survey, we kind of get some feedback of what we're actually uh, harvesting. Uh, largely, uh, uh, muscadine is, is the predominant harvest uh, cultivar uh, throughout the state, uh, followed out by Concord, Shame. Yep, you there? We saw the uh, we saw the slide you're talking about twenty percent tendency to improve for its uh, Yes. So did you ever, I, I heard part of that question. I heard that whoever spoke about the uh, on the slide was was clearer. Okay. Okay. Are we back? Can you hear us now? Yep. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We had you muted. So <laughs> we lost about two minutes. Yeah. So, about so you need me to back up? Yeah. yeah. yeah we're, 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 okay. Here you are today, so. That's all right. Uh, back back to this stuff then. Uh, do you re roughly remember what was the last thing you, you recall? Uh, saying you needed about another thousand days. Uh, yep. Uh, so, so we, we needed about another thousand acres of of, uh, vine of vineyard, uh, commercial vineyards here in the state right now. Um, the number one reason that we've we've seen from wineries in response to why we weren't using Tennessee or why we we didn't use more Tennessee fruit is because they could not find a large enough uh, supply of the Tennessee fruit they were using in the state. Um, and anecdotally, we, we've been doing uh, a bunch of workshops with uh, potential uh, uh, farmers getting into the industry. And one of my wineries spoke up and said, I, I just sourced $100,000 worth of juice out of New York, of things like Chamberson, Catawba, uh, Saval, you know, things that we grow here in the state, but we don't grow enough of to, to meet the demand that we have. Um, so we are actively as an industry trying to uh, uh, grow uh, the number of, of vineyard acres that we have in the state. So a little snapshot of, of what was harvested in 2019. Uh, muscadine was by far and away the largest uh, variety that was harvested, uh, followed by uh, Concord, Chamberson, um, Catawba, Cayuga, uh, uh, Villard Blanc, um, which you can kind of take a look at uh, how many pounds were harvested. Any, yeah. Anyone any questions on that? <laughs> um, you know, what I find really interesting is, is that muscadine being so large in terms of number, considering we really only grow it in the southeast part of the state. Um, but I think a good chunk of that actually has to come from, you know, Morris Vineyards and Sally Notch Vineyards, who are two of our larger vineyards right now. Um, Sally Notch is around... 28 acres, I believe, and that's one of our largest vineyards in the state. So that's why we're seeing such a large yield. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of our, our of the vineyards in the state are, are half acre or so. So we really are trying to be more proactive on developing commercial acreage. Uh, and to me, commercial acreage starts at a minimum of 10 acres at some point, um, especially as our wine production continues to increase. So these are our commercial those were commercial uh, vineyard production figures, and you're not. You, there's no uh, amateurs, or they're really small scale growers. So there are a lot of small scale growers. So we've we we're looking at, according to USDA, there's about uh, 900 uh, vineyard acres. Sorry, yeah, 927 vineyard acres in the entire state of Tennessee. Um, I'm looking at only about 488 to 500 acres right now as being what's commercial. That's what's actually putting into the system. If that makes sense, um, there are commercial, commercially grown fruit that's depicted on this slide. Right, correct. Or, and this is this is well, this is also looking at what what response I got back from my 2019 harvest and crush survey. Okay. So it's it's roughly like 574.26 tons reporting, which is probably pretty close to. I mean we're probably 25% off. Yeah. 
Um, so this is actually what we're producing. Uh, and uh, as I noted earlier, uh, in 2019, we produced roughly 665,000 gallons. Um, I actually have a, an accurate accounting for 408,000 of those gallons for what was actually produced. Um, and big surprise, obviously, we're trying to utilize um, and reinforce what we already grow in the state. So Muscadine and Concord and Chamberson are our top three uh, varieties that we're producing in the state. We're uh, purchasing everything, everything that we can get a hold of, and then uh, buying more to kind of offset that. So wineries by size, and this is uh, something to really look at. Out of those 68 wineries, um, this is kind of the breakdown of the industry. 31% uh, of the uh, wineries in the state right now are producing less than 1,000 gallons. 27% uh, are between that 1,000 and 5,000 gallon mark. Um, you know, only 20% are really producing more than 10,000 gallons. And why that number is important is from a, a business standpoint, that 10,000 gallon mark is really when you start getting into profitability based off, the, based off of your wine sales. Um, anything under that, and you're probably uh, mitigating your, your revenue uh, the revenue with events and other things. Um, so one of our goals beyond growing vineyard acreage is trying to get as many people over that 10,000 gallon mark that want to be at that 10,000 gallon mark as quickly as possible. Is that something that uh, once you get to 10,000, you can go to uh, use a, go into the three tier system? The uh, so I, uh, I recommend I'm trying to sell it all out your cellar door. I recommend you don't even think about wholesale until you hit about 20,000 gallons and you don't get really active until you get to 25. Um, you know, 90% of, uh, of most wineries in the country are selling DTC. That's how they're selling the product. Um, and once you look at the profit margin of going through a three tiered system, um, one, for you to be able to get your cost of goods down to low enough to where you're making four bucks a bottle, you need to be at 20,000 gallons plus, you know? Um, otherwise, you're, you'd be making around two to three dollars per bottle um, going through a three-tiered system, depending on what, pro what kind of a, a variety you have. Um, you also run into some issues with, if you're less than 20,000 gallons, you probably don't have the resources from a manpower standpoint to devote to entering into the wholesale pr uh, program. Um, because when you enter into wholesale, you really need to have a dedicated salesperson to work with the distributor and do uh, both on and off premise uh, activations and engagements. And um, again, typically, if you haven't hit that level of production, you probably don't have the time yourself to, to really dedicate into it, you know? I've heard of small wineries that can self-distribute into get in some restaurants and search some local accounts. Yes. As uh, seller, but, um, and so you can self-distribute, and I am a huge component yeah, of that. Be very so there's not many, not many wineries in Tennessee doing that right now, unfortunately, and I wish they were. Uh, one of the the pieces of legislation we changed a few years ago was to allow a uh, a winery to get a self-distribution license for um, to self-distribute within a hundred mile <coughs> radius of their production facility. And they can self-distribute to a restaurant, a hotel or convention center. So basically an on-premise location. Right. Um, they can't go to a, a liquor store. They can't go to a grocery store, which is fine because for the most part, they're not going to have the volume to do that. Yeah. Um, but what that self-distribution does allow you to do is, and you can do self-distribution. I'm, I'm a big fan of self-distribution. If you're making 5,000 gallons, go to self-distribution. And I'm not saying go make a deal with a hundred different restaurants. I'm saying, uh, go out there and connect to two or three restaurants, develop a relationship with them and become one of their featured wines on their menu. Yeah. Um, maybe you negotiate with them and you actually create their private label house wine. Um, and that becomes their, their main red and their main white that you're making for them. And you know what, when you come around to the first of the year, you know, you're going to have a guaranteed sale of at least 500 cases, 600 cases, whatever it is, because that's their main product. What about, uh, and so it's so even a wine specialty shop that you know, you can sometimes find a small retailer. You may not move a lot of wine, but at least 
they'll be, um, you can get your label introduced to some of the people who are more regular consumers of the wine. So you, you, you can't self-distribute to a, a wine liquor store right now. So that has to go through the whole t wholesale system in Tennessee. Um, and, and because of uh, Tennessee being a franchise state, I highly recommend against that as long as you can. Um, yeah. Because uh, unfortunately, once you sign that contract, you have to give up your self-distribution contract. Oh, so you have to self-distribute or yes. third party. It the way the fran the way the franchise state works is you sign a basically a four life contract with the wholesaler for uh, a designated region, but stipulated in legislation right now is that once you sign that wholesale contract, you have to get rid of your your uh, uh, self distribution permit. So so if I if, if you had, if I had a winery in in uh, Bristol or Johnson City, and I couldn't go I, I couldn't distribute through a, a distributor based in Memphis? So as of right now, no. Yeah. Um, as of right now, no. However, um, you know, for, from a, a larger standpoint of things, um, depending on the product you're creating, 75% of, of the uh, wholesale revenue in wine sales in Tennessee actually comes from the greater Nashville area. Um, you know, so so if you were to enter market and look at, at Memphis, that's it's a hard, it doesn't make any rational sense, unfortunately, right now, unless you, I mean, even if you had one or two dedicated people, um, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, challenging market here to do that. And, and if you want to have further discussion, I'd, I'd be glad to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with you on it. But. I, I, I'm just, I'm picking locations out of the air. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. No, right now you can't. Um, but what you can do is you can operate two satellite tasting rooms. So if your production, and you can do those satellite tasting rooms anywhere in, the, in the, uh, the state right now. So if your operation is up by Bristol, Tennessee, and you want to open up a tasting room in downtown Knoxville and a tasting room in downtown Nashville, you are more than welcome to. And those tasting rooms act just like your tasting room at your production facility. Um, so you do tastings, you can sell by the glass, you can sell bottles to go home with, you can do wine clubs, events, and all that stuff right out of it. So that, that's kind of your footprint extension into a, a, another market right now. Yeah. So what has TFWA been up to this past year? Uh, we've been doing a lot of consumer marketing. Um, initially, the TFWA was founded for the purpose of legislative uh, development, but over the past three, four years, we've been shifting our focus to uh, do a little more bigger picture stuff. Um, so we distributed uh, winery brochures and event uh, Excuse me, information maps that have been about 40,000 units last year. And these are distributed to the, uh, the state tourism uh, rest stops across the, uh, across the highways system, uh, as well as events and uh, trade shows we've been activating at. Uh, we put on about six uh, wine festivals last year specific for Tennessee wine. Um, part of uh, uh, the benefit of being part of our association is uh, a winery is able to come a farm winery or a winery can come to a wine festival and sell their product directly at that wine festival. Uh, we've been doing a lot of digital marketing, uh, both through um, uh, event ad buys and uh, uh, social media and, and uh, SEO keyword uh, ad buy. Um, we've been doing TV interviews and there's a picture of me on Today in Nashville uh, with uh, the Nashville Psalm and the host from the TV show. And I've been participating in a lot of tourism conferences. Um, from an enrichment standpoint, um, and again, this is part of our, our uh, uh, adding more value for our members, um, is moving away from just uh, legislative stuff. We have engaged in uh, educational sessions. Um, the TFWA used to hold quarterly business meetings. We now hold quarterly educational sessions. Uh, and these educational sessions usually last about half the day. Um, they may be on stuff like grant writing. Uh, it may be on a uh, uh, vineyard topics that may be on sales and distribution topics. We actually had a really good presentation on the wholesale system um, from the vice president of Lippman Brothers uh, came in and talked about the reality of the industry. And um, he even, you know, professed that, you know, if, in, unless you are able to handle this point, this price point in, in terms of uh, profit margin and you have the dedicated staff, don't get into it. And he was very uh, honest about, you know, discouraging people from getting into wholesale unless they were ready for it. 
Um, you know, we do uh, uh, quality control uh, uh, classes and fermentation classes just on, on a variety of topics. Um, we also introduced quarterly networking socials this past year. Um, so besides the educational classes, we're just holding get togethers where industry and non-industry can kind of get together and drink and talk. Um, we had two of these this past year, one in West Tennessee and one in East Tennessee. Um, we'll be doing another three this year and I'll, I'll send you guys the details and I invite you guys to come out uh, because um, we'll be opening it up to brewers, distillers, uh, some hospital and tourism folk. Um, and and uh, hobbyists as well to kind of come out and, and just share and, and talk about things in general. Um, we've also started some introductory workshops. Uh, we've done about five of them so far this year, and this was in a, a conjunctive project with Department of Ag, uh, UT Extension, um, and Center for Profitable Agriculture, where we're um, talking to existing um, farmers on the opportunities to diversify into the grape and wine industry and really kind of keying into not just getting into the grape, getting into grapes, but actually what grapes they should grow, how to grow them and how to make it profitable from the start. And I think, um, you know, after my conversation with Dr. Lockwood, it's something that's been um, really needed because we've never really done that before. I know we've had a lot of, of farmers get into growing grapes, you know, 10, 15 years ago, no one really kind of educated them on, on the, business aspect of you know how to grow and who to sell them to kind of thing so so i want to i want to see the acreage increase but i want to make sure everyone's becoming profitable as they do this um we've also been doing a lot of just development in general so from an advocacy advocacy standpoint this past year legislative session um we actually as silly as it sounds uh, had to pass a, a law to allow a winery to self-fulfill their satellite facility Initially, when they had the satellite facility bill drafted, they had to service their own satellite facility through a wholesaler. So we got that removed. So as long as you're producing less than 50,000 gallons, you can service your own satellite facility with your own wine. Uh, we got rid of a, a $1,000 privilege tax that was on the books and was not being collected that now the Department of Revenue is about to start collecting. And basically, it's a privilege tax use of $1,000 that you give to the state, the county, and the municipality you're in for the privilege of setting up your operation. So that we repealed that, and then we uh, uh, created the Wine and Grape Board. Uh, we've been doing a lot of strategic partner development. You can kind of see a long list of, of new uh, friends that, that are kind of helping us build um, our plans and execute our plans over the next uh, a few years. Um, working with the National Grape and Research Alliance, Wine America a lot more, doing a lot more on the federal level of things. Um, uh, larger partnerships between the Tennessee Distillers Guild and the Tennessee Craft Brewers Guild, uh, uh, engaging a lot more with the Hospitality and Tourism Association. Uh, we also just launched a registered apprenticeship this year. Uh, and this is actually a joint venture between Vesta, uh, the Tennessee Board of Regents, Pellissippi State, and Dyersburg State. Um, where uh, wineries and vineyards both are able to access up to eight different uh, federally recognized registered apprenticeship programs. Um, things that are in wine business, uh, enology, um, production technician, viticulture, uh, vineyard management, um, where they're able to do on the job training with a winery or vineyard in Tennessee and take online classes for um, their certification, for, for an apprenticeship certification. Um, in conjunction with that, we are working with Pellissippi State um, to actually roll those registered apprenticeship credits directly into an AS degree. Uh, and um, hopefully within the next two years, we'll have an AS degree program set up at Pellissippi State. Uh, and they are working with UT right now to figure out how they can roll those credits directly into UT for a bachelor's degree. So the, the, the big goal is in the next five to 10 years, is to have a full uh, viticulture and winemaking program through either UT or MTSU. So, a lot, lot of educational development going on. Yeah. The Wine and Grape Board. Um, so this was uh, effective July 1st, 2019. Uh, the Wine and Grape Board was created. Uh, it is a seven man board. Uh, two members serve for four years, two members for three years, or for three years and one member for two years. Uh, I believe Rick Rails uh, somewhere in the uh, convent, uh, conference with you guys, and he's one of the members. Um, by law, 
Uh, the seven members are a, the Commissioner of Agriculture and or a representative and uh, Assistant Commissioner Keith Harrison uh, is been his designee. Um, the Commissioner of Tourism or uh, his designee and he has uh, designated uh, Assistant Commissioner Melanie Beecham who's in charge of rural uh, tourism development. Uh, Tennessee wine producer appointed by the governor and, and all of these positions are appointed by the governor. So the association has no say in um, who's actually on this board. Um, but Bill Sanderson is the, uh, the governor's appointee for Tennessee producer. Carrie Cox, who is the owner of uh, Sally Notch, is the uh, Tennessee grape and fruit producer appointed by the governor. Um, Dr. Tony Johnston is the uh, director of MTSU's fermentation science program. Uh, and, and he was uh, uh, appointed by the governor and uh, the other two appointed by the governor uh, can be a mixed bag. It's, it's someone that is um, in, in the wine industry in the state in terms of production, marketing, sales, journalism, education, um, and really it's kind of a broad spectrum uh, catch all. Um, so as the industry develops, um, we're able to pull in some expertise from other uh, sources, whether it be journalism, PR, uh, whether it be wholesale, um, you know, things like that as we kind of expand. Uh, but initially, Kix Brooks and uh, Rick Riddle have both been appointed to this position. Uh, the main objectives, and the, this is by statute. So uh, this is the, the directives of um, what the industry can actually spend, what the uh, wine and grape board is actually set to spend money on and what they're tasked with. Um, so to increase the number of wineries in the state, improve the quality of wine produced by wineries in the state, uh, promote the wine industry and viticulture in this state, implement and maintain a wholesale rebate program for Tennessee wineries. Um, in addition to those four uh, main objectives, the board shall issue an annual report to the wine uh, on the wine industry and viticulture in the state to the governor, commissioner of finance, and the chairs of agricultural and natural resources uh, in the house and the chairs of energy, agricultural, and natural resources in the Senate. So kind of a big, broad <laughs> spectrum, uh, but also a little bit limiting. Uh, the wine and grape board had their first meeting. Um, the 18th of last month, I'm oh, sorry, the 10th of last month of February. Um, and it was an election. Basically they just got an election of their officers. Um, so the current chairman is uh, Bill Sanderson, and the current um, uh, vice chair is um, Rick Riddle. Um, so they basically established that. They, they determined that, hey, we have a uh, $300,000 uh, line item budget uh, or line item from the uh, governor's budget from last year. Um, technically, it was because it's a line item non-recurring funding, it was supposed to go away at the end of June. But given the fact that the board did not get seated until Christmas, basically, um, and obviously with everything going on with the, the virus, um, Department of Agriculture is actively working with the state uh, budget committee to have that um, $300,000 roll over. Uh, in addition, there's an additional $150,000 that have been appropriated in the governor's budget this year um, to, to go into the fund. Um, so uh, that money should be rolling in, hopefully, and. Uh, they're just waiting for clarification on a few things in terms of the extension and what they're actually able to spend it on in terms of uh, what legal from what the, what the legal department from Department of Ag is, is comfortable with. <laughs> so it's a lot, lot of, a uh, lot of uh, hurry up and wait right now. Unfortunately, guys, the reality of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's something that hasn't been done before, so you have to. What do we need to do? Right. Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. And are we've, you, we've. Are you uh, piggybacking off of the states that have, you know, a longer history of winemaking? Uh, you know, California and Washington, they come on. And... Yeah. So, um, so a, a little, uh, uh, I guess, further background. Um, in addition to this wine and grape board, so last July, um, we formed a. Uh, we actually were just having a strategic, a, the TFWA held their strategic planning session, but um, we decided to open it up to uh, larger beyond just the uh, organization. And we brought in actually, uh, Greg was with us um, from, from TVOS and we had 
uh, representatives, representatives from UT, Pellissippi, MTSU, Department of Tourism, Department of Ag. We had a few retailers, the Grocers Association, uh, Hospital and Tourism Association. Uh, we had about 23 individuals come together for a day and a half strategic development session. And from that, we've developed a wine and grape task force. And the task force has kind of been looking at um, the challenges, opportunities that have been facing the industry over the past few years. And we've kind of developed a rough playbook and um, five different subcommittees that are um, working on education and workforce development, working on uh, marketing and branding, um, you know, th things like that, uh, you know, funding mechanisms for the industry um, that we're offering this playbook to the wine and grape board to kind of um, uh, utilize for, for main tax, I guess we can say. Um, and for myself, a lot of my, um, so I, I, I'm an active member of what's called the Shrek. It's part of uh, uh, Wine America, uh, which is the national association of, of, of wineries and vineyards in the state, in the country. Um, and the Shrek is actually all of the directors from all the individual states where we have monthly calls and talk about things. Um, and I'm looking at a lot of the best practices that, that have worked for some of the states. Um, a lot of what I've been keying into right now has been what Missouri has been doing. Um, just because uh, I think they have a similar consumer um, that we do. Uh, they have a similar tourism consumer as well as a, a buying consumer. Uh, they also work with a lot of the same varieties that we grow. You there? That, that was Missouri? Missouri, Dude, yes. Kind of, there's a little blip. Sorry, yes. Um, Missouri. So Missouri, Missouri, Missouri's been a big key for, for me right now um, because of the similarities of customer base and the similarities of uh, grape varieties they grow. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love looking at Washington and Oregon, but they're in a completely different level than we are right now. And it's nice to look at some of those things, but you could, you could even say Texas, but then again, very different uh, climate. Yes, yes. Um, so really, for me, it's it's Missouri, it's North Carolina, um, it's Ohio, um, and even to some extent Kentucky. Um, yeah. You know, so that's kind of what I'm looking at in terms of what they've done for best practices, uh, because I think the mindset of the consumer, the mindset of their legislature, and the, and the um, the types of, of wines they're producing are very similar, you know? Yeah. Um, so challenges we need to address as an industry. Can, uh, we're looking at continued funding. And again, we, we talked about, you know, what can we do is what the wine and grape board is trying to figure out. Uh, we've already identified what we need to do in, in, in some respects. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out continued funding. Um, we're trying to figure out how to get t more Tennessee wineries to start claiming Tennessee, uh, uh, Tennessee on their label. Um, because even the wineries right now that qualify for it from a TTB standpoint aren't. Um, industry education and research, uh, trying to gain more market share. You know, as of 2017, when you look at uh, DTC sales and wholesale all, all together in the state of Tennessee, uh, Tennessee wine made up about 1.2% of market share, which is pretty, pretty small. Um, perception on past experiences, um, you know, this, there are a lot of consumers that have a, a bad perception of, of Tennessee wine because they tried some wine 15, 20 years ago and they haven't tried it since, you know, so we're, we're working on that. Uh, lack of fruit production. Um, our wineries and tasting rooms are really spread out and this makes it really hard to activate uh, successful um, marketing campaigns for uh, wine tourism. Um, we have no experimental research vineyards going currently in Tennessee. Um, Dr. Lockwood, I believe, said the last uh, research station from active research uh, kind of shut down in 1988. Um, so we are uh, having large talks with UT Extension on how we reactivate some of those. Uh, and this kind of goes into the current cost of growing grapes in Tennessee is, is higher than uh, we'd like it to be. And part of that is uh, the lack of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, efficiency from the research uh, standpoint. Uh, and the other one is uh, size and scale. You know, we have, um, it, it costs just about as much to maintain one acres, a one acre vineyard as it does to maintain a 10 acre vineyard. 
there's difference in harvest and, and all that stuff, but your, your, your maintenance is about the same. So when we have a lot of growers that are only growing a half acre to one acre, they're not going to see a large enough profitability yield on their return to, to really make it worthwhile. But if they expand out in terms of size and we get to 10 acres, you know, we can get a little more profitable for them. Uh, costs it's, are the same for it, it, it's roughly um, your labor costs obviously are higher, um, but and and you'll you'll have a, 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 especially when it comes to like harvest and pruning and all that stuff. Um, but it's it's roughly about the same cost to operate a one acre vineyard as it is to operate a ten acre vineyard. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but it just takes time. It's t time time and manpower is, is the big difference. <laughs> Um, the plus side is once you start getting into that that um, you know, that 10 to 15 acre range, it starts looking to make sense to uh, mechanize. You know, it's really hard to to mechanize when you're less than 10 acres. It just it, it I don't think it feasibly makes sense um, unless you're doing a, a co-op of equipment with other vineyards around you. And I think there are actually now eight mechanical harvesters within the state of Tennessee. Um, and some of the guys do share equipment. Yeah. And for the for the wine part of it, also there's mobile bottling lines. Uh, yes, uh, there is a mobile bottling line in the state, um, and they can come in and within a ten hour day, a ten or eleven hour day, they can actually knock out almost twenty five hundred gallons worth of, of wine bottled, yeah. bottled, labeled, and reboxed. So. <laughs> um, there is also a mobile can. There's also a mobile canning line in Tennessee as well, in case you wanted to can your wine. Yeah, You laugh, you laugh, but 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 canning is becoming a very big thing for wine. I don't think it's going away this time. So. Yeah, it's you know when you think about being at a tailgate and not having any glass containers. Sure. Yeah, I mean, go go into a picnic, go to the beach, go to the pool, yeah. you know. Um, so, um, so currently we're also looking at the fact that we've got no available industry degree edu degree program or formal education. Like I said, we're working on that uh, actively, um, communicating between industry partners. And I really do feel bad for not being there this weekend, guys, because that was one of the big things. Is I, I want us to, I want the TFWA, the TVOS, and the Chattanooga Wine Club to start. Uh, reconnecting on, on, on things where we can. Um, you know, labor is a big issue uh, from a vineyard worker, tra trained professionals in the winery and uh, professionals in the tasting room has been a huge issue for us. Um, and then how do we sustain the momentum? Because over the past uh, year and a half or so, we've started to get a lot of uh, interest from, uh, I don't want to say, from from, gov from government, from the state government, um, you know, and their agencies, which um, which is good because that helps us with that first challenge of continued funding. Because as long as we're starting to, to gain support from the state industry, we, we may see some more state funding come into us. So. Certainly, certainly through tourism. I mean, yes, we, we did include um, little small restaurants or bistros or antique yeah. shops or little small attractions so, and, and that's why I, area. yeah and and um you know kind of new with that is we we did not the tfwa didn't really have a functioning relationship with the state department of tourism two three years ago four years ago um we're, we've developed a lot better relationship with them over the past two years um but rural economic development is a big key for the state um and uh vineyard and winery is kind of a a uh <laughs> It's, it's the big guns when it comes to developing rural rural economies because um, tourism sees that an, an, an average wine tourist will spend an additional $30 per day per person, um, not at, not just at the winery, but like in the area they're at. And that's at that local restaurant, at the local antique store. So if you get a car full of four people coming down and you get an extra $120 dropped into your community on that day, that's a, a big you know uptick for a lot of local communities. You know, um, and as of as of last month, I, I'm now on the uh, the state hospitality and, and tourism association's board of directors. So, um, you know, we are trying to be a, a very active in developing our tourism footprint over the next few years. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm wondering because there's a there's a model that I saw I've seen this work really well in Wisconsin. They have a such a tremendous uh, artisanal cheese uh, industry that you know the the cross the tie the tie in with being able to sell some cheese and maybe some sausage or crackers or something in a winery tasting room being able to yeah. handle selling packaged foods. Is, uh, so. Just about every winery in the state uh, is carrying Sweetwater cheese in their tasting room. Um, some are carrying some other uh, cheeses as well. Um, most of the guys are offering that. Um, you should talk to Rick Riddle while, you're, while you get a second and, and ask him about his idea for a uh, combined wine and cheese trail out there in East Tennessee. Yeah, because I would, you know, if you've got other, you know, Sweetwater's good, they're, they're good, they're big, but if you mm -hmm. get some other smaller local dairy producers, or, you know, forming a creamery or something. And I, I think all of the wineries are open to that. A lot of the wineries are carrying local artisan crafters products inside, um, you know, and, and, and whatnot, uh, pottery or, or woodwork or things like that. Um, so it, it's definitely, it's a, uh, it's a retail outlet for the local artisan crafters. And yeah, well, all types of art, artisanal products. Yep, yep. Um, so what's coming up on the horizon? Um, from a viticulture standpoint, uh, we're going to continue to do uh, new grower workshops over the next uh, uh, year or two. We'll probably do another 10 over the next two years. Um, and, and those are really targeted at uh, existing farmers that are looking to diversify their operation into the industry. And from the get-go, I'm, I'm encouraging almost all of them to look at a farm winery license um, because from a profitability standpoint, um, you know, if you can see three to five thousand dollars of profit per acre on just growing grapes, that's great. But from a as a farm winery, that same one acre can yield between you know twelve thousand to twenty four thousand dollars of profit as a wine. Um, so I'm really encouraging them to look at farm winery as an option. Um, we'll be actively working with uh, UT Extension. Go ahead. What was that? Oh, it just it was, wine is a, a real value-added product for yes. agriculture. Yeah, uh, uh, wine is the largest value-added product next to tobacco um, when it comes to agriculture. Um, UT Extension Agent Training. Um, so we are actively pursuing um, uh, getting some of the extension agents that are across the state uh, up to speed on some basics of viticulture. Uh, Dr. Lockwood is working on uh, the rudimentary program of that right now, um, but hopefully before the end of the year, we'll be ho hosting a boot camp uh, in multiple parts across the state, getting extension agents who have a horticulture background, uh, a little more familiarity with viticulture um, to really aid with anyone that's trying to grow across the state. Uh, continued education workshops for existing growers. Uh, we're also going to be looking at expansion grants for existing growers. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out how we can uh, do either dollar for dollar matching funds for existing vineyards to increase their acreage. Um, and then research programs, restarting the, uh, the, the UT uh, research stations that used to be looking at grapes in, in the state. Um, from a winery perspective, uh, we are looking at, a, a, at developing a form of quality assurance program and whether that's like Germany's VDP program or following what Ontario or North Carolina has been, has been trying to develop, we're not quite sure what that's going to look like yet. Uh, but ways of improving the quality of, of, of wine in the state. Um, this is the fun, the next one's the fun one really is, uh, and kind of the topic of discussion from me at our annual conference this past year, but defining a Tennessee regional identity. And um, before we continue to try to market the state, um, we need to figure out what our identity is and whether that's us taking ownership of fruit wines, uh, us taking ownership of the uh, fortified style wines we've been producing, um, whether it's refining of a few of the hybrid varieties that we grow here and, and try to find, it, find a way to make the best Jamerson we can. Um, you know, we're going to be developing uh, a regional identity, I think, really, and trying to solidify and get buy-in from all of the, the larger wineries over the next year. Um, so that'll, that'll in, entail some winemakers participating in uh, marketing discussions and uh, panel discussions as well as some consumers participating in those discussions. You can get that done. You can focus on a varietal. I know, you know, 
recently Indiana named, I think they named Tra Traminette as their grape of the state or their state grape. They got a, a little resolution, they got a resolution from their legislature. It's so, like uh, Norton and uh, Chardonnay in Missouri. So I, I don't know if, if we're at the point where we need to have a state grape right now. Um, I, I think that we do need to narrow it down to four styles. And a style may be a particular variety. Um, and That's not certainly, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, when you think of Bordeaux, it's not particularly a variety, it's a style of wine. When you think of port, it's it's a style, you know. Um, so there, there's some discussion there. And it's some of the discussion is too, is is it really, is it what we what we think we want to be, or what we're trying to be, or do we take ownership of what we're already doing well? And, you know, we had uh, the president of vinoshipper.com uh, come out to our uh, annual conference this past year. And, you know, when he's pulling up the data and showing us that, you know, Ohio is the number one state we ship to um, at, from Tennessee, when he looks at what's selling for us, you know, around the country, you know, we, we see that it's, it's, it's fruit wine, it's muscadine. And, regardless of, of anyone's personal feelings on that, does that mean, you know, should we take that as a cue of, if that's what people are, are already associating with us, then do we just need to make the best blackberry wine you can find? You know? Uh, so that discussion is is kind of what's happening in terms of determining our original identity. On, on that, the, other, the other part of that equation is gonna to have to be, how much blackberry wine can you sell? Is you want to do for a couple that you can, that will have a national market, and then, well, or it's, it's a it's another thing I know down in Alabama they're arguing about because there's some of these new Pierce disease resistant hybrids mm -hmm. at UC Davis and they're trying to because they're becoming available on the commercial the commercial nurseries and whether to how to whether to try and push that direction or to just say well we do muscadines we've done muscadines for so long it's all out there right. We, well, you know, question. It, it's it's a uh, it's part of a, a larger discussion, um, <clears throat> and and you know when you look at the bottom line of some of our larger producers, their top sellers are the muscadine and blackberry, both in in tasting room, uh, as well as what we're shipping out of state. And that's what Vino Ship was kind of telling us. You know, this is what you're shipping, this is what you're selling. <clears throat> so there are there are customers out there for it. Um, does it, it, it is a double-edged sword because, you know, there are some wine professionals that don't look at you as a serious wine region when that, when that's what you're producing. But, um, I think that's a, a, uh, unfortunate because those same wine professionals also will poo-poo, you know, barefoot Moscato. But when you look at the, uh, the top selling wines in the country, uh, barefoot Moscato is usually in the top three categories. So, yeah. <clears throat> You know, I, I think per perception and the reality of the bottom line are, are two different things we've got to deal with. Um, you know, and, and just because we identify a regional identity and, and that's what we want to try to focus on from a messaging standpoint, doesn't mean we can't produce other things. You know, just because you may, may try to focus in on a regional identity of, of three or four different styles or, or varieties of wine, doesn't mean you can't work with 20 different varieties in the state, 30 different varieties in the state. Um, but from a statewide messaging standpoint, we have to take ownership of something, you know? Um, from a market, ex sorry. Um, so from a market expansion standpoint, um, you know, we're, we're continuing a general awareness program to develop, develop interest um, and, and understanding of, of Tennessee wineries. Um, when I first came on the job, I was doing some uh, uh, consumer surveys at our wine festivals and an average consumer that was coming to a wine festival already was not uh, actively aware of more than three wineries in the state. Um, so for the most part, most individuals that are even living here in the state only know about a handful of wineries. Um, so really, now that we're at 70 in the state, it's, it's developing an awareness of, hey, we exist and there are numerous wineries across the state to try. Um, kind of with that consumer education program, besides general awareness, is actually once we finish refining our, our regional identity is pushing that regional identity to the consumer. Um, if you go to TennesseeWines.com right now, um, 
in, under the about section, you, we talk about 12 different grape varieties that we grow, it, grow in Tennessee. Um, and we're talking about and trying to link it back to something the consumer is already aware of. You know, so if you like a, 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 a Pinot Noir, you know, try this Chamberson. If you like a Gewürztraminer or, or a Riesling, maybe try a Treminet kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're trying to find ways of linking what we can do and what we do do um, to something the consumer might be familiar with already. Um, Back to that self-distribution push, we kind of talked about it earlier, going to the restaurants and the hotels. Uh, I'm a big advocate for this. Um, I think it is an underutilized tool by a lot of the wineries um, in expanding their awareness and expanding their um, sales. Um, and I'm gonna keep banging the drum on trying to get a few wineries to, to undertake this task. Um, working on clustering of tasting rooms uh, to increase wine trails um, and really increase wine trail activation. You know, the Gatlinburg Wine Trail is a prime example. Um, so the Rocky Top Wine Trail has been around for years, and it's, it's been made up of um, wineries that are part of the same organization. But the new Gatlinburg Wine Trail has expanded out, and it's not just the same organization with all the wineries. You know, it, it's got other, other entities that are part of it. And I think in their first, like, three months of, of activation, I think they, they saw, like, 300,000 people come through. Um, through through and complete that trail and and the the money coming in to the bottom line to those wineries from the wine trail activation has been uh, huge so really trying to get um, our tasting rooms to cluster a little better uh, especially as satellite stores continue to pop up and to kind of uh, put emphasis on developing those wine trails and then we're looking at uh, increasing partnerships and collaborations um, with other organizations, individuals, um, both state, uh, regional, private, all that fun stuff, just to try to, to grow the, the, uh, the tent of support that we have for the industry. And that's kind of it, guys. Thank you for the overview. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any, any questions? No? That's it. Not really. All right. Well, again, I apologize. I can't be there in person. Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll get a chance to see you guys the next one. Um, we uh, have been working with uh, Greg and the Chattanooga Wine Club on um, you guys setting up an information booth at our Chattanooga Wine Festival, um, which as of yesterday has officially been postponed until June 20th. Um, I don't know if you saw, but the, uh, the, the mayor of Chattanooga has put a, a standstill on everything, too, in Chattanooga. So um, we're moving from, from SIP Tennessee, uh, Chattanooga from, has moved from March 28th to June 20th. It'll still be at the First Horizon Pavilion and hopefully you guys still have an activation there with us. Great. All right, thank you guys. Well, I got a quick question for you before you leave. Uh, I'm the guy doing the audio and video. Would you mind sending to Greg a copy of your, uh, your presentation? And if you did indeed record that, would you care yep. to send it as well? Yep, not a problem. You just send it to Greg and I'll uh, Greg Sayer and I'll and I'll get it from him. Okay. Fantastic. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.